Ephesians 6, 4 is one of my favorite verses and one that I quote oftentimes and one that my kids happen to quote to me often as well. Graham, I think this is his favorite verse because every time I say something about cleaning his room or making good grades, he says, fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath. And he loves this verse. I'm not sure if he knows many other verses, but he knows this verse very, very well. And it's also one of my favorite verses because it's a verse that I think we as fathers need to live by and need to remember. First and foremost, remember, God loves children. Matthew 19, he says, let the children come to me. Do not hinder them. Matthew 18, he says, if any of you uh, cause a child to stumble, to leave the Lord, it'd be better for somebody to tie a heavy stone around his neck and throw him into the ocean. God loves children. Many times we'll have a baby who will cry in church, and some people get really upset about it. Sometimes we'll have somebody at church, and they'll have, you know, a toddler. And that toddler will be sitting there uh, playing and whatever else he may do. And he may sit up in the uh, pew and look back and make funny faces at everybody. And it's funny when you're preaching because you'll notice like two whole sections focus right there on that child. Now, early in my preaching career, I used to think, man, people are getting distracted. This is bad. Now, later in my preaching career, I realized God perhaps is paying more attention to that toddler than, you know, and then he's paying attention to me. He may be like everybody else because God loves children. Let us never forget the importance of young people to the church. Jesus emphasized it over and over and over. Jesus loves children. And so it's important for us to bring our children to church services It's important for us to introduce our children to Jesus and teach them to love Jesus. And it's important for us to raise our children up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. Now let's go to our next slide. Many times people will bring up the passage out of the book of Proverbs. And it's one we've all memorized, right? Train up a child in the way he should go. And when he was old, when he is old, he will not depart from it. And we read this passage and we think, okay, you know, if I'm a Christian and if I show my kid how to be a Christian and if I teach him how to be a Christian and I bring him to church all the time, then this proverb means my child will always 100% grow up as a Christian. This means my child will not leave the Lord. And we convince ourselves if our children ever do leave the Lord. We convince ourselves that if our children ever do grow up and not love the Lord as much or in the same way in which we do, that we failed. But what we have to realize is that training up children in many ways is not a science. It's not a two plus two equals four. There's free will that's there. There are children who are different than other children. Anyone who's had multiple children will realize very quickly that our children are not all the same. Some are more active, some are more athletic, some are more studious, some are better at video games. All kids are different, and all kids have to be communicated to, taught, and led in a different way. What I'm saying is that although the Bible is our rule book of how to raise kids, In many ways, there is no rule book of how to raise kids. As a parent, you pray, pray, pray. and We'll talk about that here in a few minutes. But as a parent, you do the best you can do to imbue, to pass on your love for God to those children. As a parent, you do the best that you can do to show those children why Christianity is the best way in life. As a parent, you've got to trust God and trust that God will work through you, through the church and through the world to remind your children of the importance of God. If your children grow up and leave the Lord, I want you to know that you're not alone. It happened to Noah. 
The righteous man who saved the world, at least at eight, as the world is being destroyed, had a child who did not live the way that he should. We read about Isaac, and we see the way in which Jacob and his wife oftentimes would abuse him and fool him and work in opposite ways. We see where Esau seemed to be a person who did not love the Lord properly. And yet Isaac's one of the patriarchs, one of the great men of faith. You see, the very last judge and the first prophet of Scripture, Samuel, a man who brought his nation back to God and brought his nation to where it was ready for the kingship, his children did not love the Lord, and his children hurt his ministry. David, a man after God's own heart, a man who established the throne in which Jesus will reign forever and ever, Begin reading about his family tree. Find out about Amnon. Find out about Absalom. Find out about just pretty much any of his children, even Solomon. And you see that even people after God's own heart, even people who love the Lord and who do everything they can to train their families in the way they should go, don't always have children who follow in their paths. And so at this point, we could fall back and we could say, well, you know, if it happened to Noah and if it happened to Isaac and it happened to Samuel and it happened to David, if it happened to many of these other great godly people, then what hope do you and I have today to raise up faithful children? Is there any hope? Is there any way in which it will happen? We look at statistics in Churches of Christ, and nationwide, they claim that about 40% of our kids who, as we say colloquially, grow up coming to church, remain faithful at the age of 30. Now, you look at this congregation, and the percentage is much, much higher. This congregation puts a huge investment in our young people, and it shows in the results. But is there hope? Is there a possibility that we can work in a way that will teach our children to love the Lord, to love God, and to put God first in everything that they do? I want us to talk about a few principles that you and I need to apply to our life in order to raise our children up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. They're simplistic, but they need to be remembered. The first principle is communicate. Tell your children, emphasize to your children about Jesus. Make sure they know the Lord and make sure they know him well. Do you know sometimes we don't communicate very well? You ever see like an older couple and they've gotten to the point where they don't even have to speak sentences anymore. They've been around so long, each other so long to where they can almost just grunt at each other. Mm, mm-hmm. And it's like they already know what each other's saying. They've been together forever, right? You ever see sometimes a younger couple and they're wondering, what is my husband thinking? What is my wife thinking? And sometimes we go through life and we assume We gather, okay, they're probably thinking about this. This is probably what's going on, but we don't communicate. And as a matter of fact, we totally don't know and don't understand what's happening. Many times we raise our kids and we're so busy and we assume because we've sent our kids to Bible class and because we've sent our kids to youth group and because we try to put them around good friends We assume that they're understanding and that they're knowing who Jesus is and what it is that you do to follow Jesus. The Bible makes it clear that as a parent, you have an obligation to teach your children. It's not the youth minister's job necessarily. It's not the preacher's job. It's not the school district's job. It's not their friend's job. It is the job of a parent to teach and to communicate to their children. Notice how Moses puts this, a classic passage, Deuteronomy chapter 6, and look at verses 6 through 8. 
In 6 through 8, as Moses is about to go into the Ten Commandments, he says, I want you to know the commandments, and I want you to make sure your children, your heritage, knows the commandments. You need to talk about God, he says, when you rise up and when you lie down, when you're on the journey and you're on the way, you need to talk about them at the dinner table. Every opportunity you have, you need to work in a spiritual concept which is there. It's important to use every opportunity to teach your children to follow the Lord. And that's what that Ephesians 6, 4 passage is. Don't hurt your children, fathers. Raise them up, nurture and admonition. Train them, communicate with them what the command of God is to each and every one of them. Well, how do you communicate? A lot of people like that passage. It's uh, Proverbs 13, 24. And that passage says, He who spares the rod hates or spoils his son. That's the second half of that verse. And sometimes people bring that passage up and they say, well, that means you need to spank your children. The Bible says you better be physical with them. For some children, that works. For some children, that doesn't work as well. In this culture, in this time, sometimes there's other ways you can discipline a child. But discipline needs to be present. And as you discipline your kids, you don't do it because you're angry. You don't do it just because they did something wrong. The purpose of that discipline is to correct, to train, and to lead in a proper way. As you train your children, as you discipline your children, discipline them to be good citizens. Discipline them to be New Testament Christians. Discipline them to show respect and love to other people in the way in which they need to go. Remember in your family... There are monuments. And what's a monument you have in your family? A monument that's in my family is there's a squirrel in a Christmas tree. That sounds strange, doesn't it? But we have a doll that was bought many, many years ago that the kids, when they were young, wanted to place it into the Christmas tree. Okay, you know, whatever. And now every year... They find where that squirrel is. It's always hidden inside. And when they find it, it reminds them of the legacy of what it means to grow up in this family. Now, that's weird because I'm weird. What's the legacy you have in your family? What is a quirk? Maybe it's some kind of strange thing that you eat at Thanksgiving. Maybe it's some kind of strange habit you do on Black Friday when you're shopping or that you do at Christmas or that you do on family vacation. What is the quirk that you have? Devise quirks. Devise legacies that remind kids of their faith. As you and I look in our Bibles, we see in Joshua chapter 4 and verse 21, as the children of Israel are crossing across the Jordan River, they come across, and in my reading of it, there's two monuments. Some people say there's just one monument. I think there's two. One monument is under the water. They lay 12 stones under the water, and the water comes back over it. And they can always say, you know, there's 12 stones under that water to remind you of what's happened. Also, as they crossed, each tribe had to carry a great rock, and they created maybe a pyramid, maybe a pile of stones by the river there. Why? Why would God command such a silly thing? He tells us. Joshua 4, 21. He says, you know what? When your children, when your children walk by here and they say, Daddy, why is that pile of stones there? He says, you take that opportunity to tell your children how God saved you. When your child says, Mom, what's going on over there? Why is there that pile? You take that opportunity to remind them that God is always there. And he parted this great river to take care of us. Now, in some ways, this building is a legacy. As you think of this building and as you think of the building down, downtown... 
Many families here can remember generation upon generation upon generation. Men who have filled these pews, ladies who have taught in Bible classes and affected so many ages. That's a legacy. That's a monument. And when your children see that pew, even after you're gone, they will remember. But what other legacies are you planting? What other memories are you leaving behind that when you're gone, your children will say, I remember when grandma and grandpa used to do this. And it brings forth a spiritual lesson, which is there. That's communication. Communication is more than just what you say. Communication is more than just your body language. Communication is the things you leave behind, the things which last from generation to generation, the things which will be there forever. And so as we communicate, think about communication. What do you want your children to know about God? If someone was to ask your child, why do y'all take the Lord's Supper every Sunday? If someone would ask your child, why do you be baptized? What is the purpose of baptism? Or where's your choir? Where's your piano? Where's the rock band? Have you communicated to your children where they have an answer for that? Have you communicated to your children so they can teach someone else to love the Lord? What do you want to communicate? Doctrine is important. That's not the only thing to communicate. Ethics. The way that you treat someone who is perceived to be less. The way you should treat a neighbor. The idea of forgiveness to someone who has wronged you. Are you communicating that to your children? Are you raising your children up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord? Are you teaching love? Are you teaching grace? Are you teaching those deep concepts that are so hard for us even to enunciate? Do your children know about grace? Do your children know about love? Do your children know that God loves them even though they may sin, even though they will sin? God is there, that Jesus died for every single one of us. Tell them about Jesus. Secondly, communicate to your children. Let them know the power of example. 1 Corinthians 11, 1, Paul will say in that passage, Follow me even as I follow Christ. Philippians chapter 3 and verse 17. Yes, verse 17. Paul says, Brethren, join me in following my example, for you have in me a pattern to follow. That Greek word, tupos. Much of our restoration movement is based upon that, following the pattern of what we see in the Bible. Have you ever heard somebody say, Do as I say and not as I do? How would you feel if your children were to grow up to be just like you? Is that a scary concept? Is that a scary thought process right there? I tell my children oftentimes, I don't want you to grow up like me. I need you to be rich to pay for my retirement. But spiritually speaking, what if your children were just like you? I've got a scary fact, teenagers. The odds of you looking like your parents when you're their age is pretty high. Now, teenagers, that's scary, right? Those of us who are older, have you ever looked in the mirror and said, Oh my goodness, that's my dad. God makes us physically where we look somewhat like our parents. Maybe it's the nose, maybe it's the eyes, maybe it's the ears, whatever it may be. But God has made us spiritually sometimes, oftentimes, where we look like our parents. What example are you teaching your children? There's a four-generation rule. You ever heard of that? 
The first generation is converted to God, gives everything to their spirituality, puts him first and foremost. The second generation is very close to that. Oftentimes, the third generation, they still attend church, but much less. And then the fourth generation barely comes at all. Because sometimes that legacy, that communication of example, drops. What example are you leaving to your children? Are you one of those people who say, you know what? I'm going to go to church. This is where I go to church. This is where I belong. Unless there's something else going on. How often do you cancel an event because you've got to go to church? Or how often do you cancel church because you have to go to an event? Your children listen, but your children also watch. And the example that you lead, the life that you lead, is a direction in which your kids go. A direction in which your kids learn. So can Jesus be seen in your life? Can Jesus be seen in the decisions that you make? Do you truly, as Matthew 6.33 says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and then worry about everything else as God adds those things to you? As you and I look at that idea of example, it's so very, very important. The third principle I want us to look at in this principle is this. Remember the power of the gospel. Remember, if you will, with me, the power of the gospel. Your kids, your children, your progeny are the most important mission field you have. Okay? It's important for us to be working over in Africa. It's important for us to be working in the foreign lands. It's important for us to be working all over the city and everywhere else. But your kids are your primary mission field. Don't go to heaven alone. Don't go to heaven and leave behind your spouse. Don't go to heaven and leave behind your children. What profit is it if a man gains the entire world and yet loses his own soul? All right, I've got an example, and I'm going to borrow Anderson. Anderson, can I borrow you? We're going to play for a second. As soon as I can find my stuff. You stand right there. Anderson's a teenager. How old are you, Anderson? Fifteen. Fifteen. All right, so he's going to be good at this. And you play baseball too, right? Oh, he's going to be really... Are you a Cardinals fan? Oh. All right. 15 in a row, 16... Where are we at? Where? I know Joni would know. All right. We're at 15 in a row. I mean, big deal. The Rangers lost 22 in a row. All right. All right. These are things you need to catch in life. All right? And a teenager has a lot to deal with. Back in my day, we just sat around and uh, played with rocks and sticks and lived in caves. Nowadays, I'm not quite that old, but close. Nowadays, they got internet, they got school, they've got everything in the world. All right. And so there's a lot of things they got to catch. The most important thing you want your kid to catch is what? Not the ball. All right. That sounds like your coach. All right. The most important thing you want your kid to catch is, seek first the kingdom of God, Christianity. You want them to be a Christian, all right? So here you go. He's a catcher. All right. Now, you've got a lot of other things in life. Now, try not to knock off the little sheets on there, the little receipts. bought this from um, Dollar General a few minutes ago, and I'm going to take it back after church. All right? All right. Most important thing for them to catch is Christianity. But they better go to school, right? So can you catch that too? Yeah. All right. Because they got to pay for your retirement. Okay. And then you got sports. Okay. Then you got girls. All right. He caught girls pretty good. All right. And then you got a social life. Oh, he's good at the social life. 
And then, let's see, you've got all the fun stuff that you do. Okay. Should have picked somebody else. All right. <laughs> and then you've got, um, what else do you have in your life? Anything? No. All right. See, I picked the wrong person. All right. Then you have, huh? Chores. Oh, chores. <laughs> all right. Then you got chores. And I know Jeff, you got a lot of chores. All right. <laughs> And then, that's all the money I had. All right. Now, as you go through and look at all that, let me see those again. You can go through and look at the things that he has, okay? Now, when you do everything like this, it's pretty easy because, man, I'm a good pitcher here. All right? But when his hands are totally full, and he's going to be able to do this because he's an athlete, but when his hands are totally full, how hard is it going to be to get church in your life? Like I said, he's able to do it. But a lot of kids, what we're doing, you can go ahead and sit down if you'd like. Just give those away to, do you have that many friends? All right, give that away to all your friends. What a lot of times we do to our kids is we say, hey, you better have straight A's. I went to a church one time where the Sunday before the ACT was given, all of our kids would skip church because their parents said, hey, we've got to make sure they'd score well on their ACTs. And I'm thinking, you know, we've got to be sure that we do well on our Bible, right? It's important for your kids to do well in school. It's important for your kids to do well in athletics. You learn a lot of lessons there. It's important that your kids have a good social life. It's important for your kids to have a good, well-rounded life, to enjoy themselves. It's important for your kids to do their chores and to do their responsibilities. But don't fill your kid up with so much stuff that they can't catch Christ, that they can't catch Jesus, that they don't see that Jesus comes first. Let me say that again. Jesus comes first in life. Your greatest mission field is your kids, is your children, are the children that you have. Luke 8, 11 says that seed is the word of God. Romans 1, 16 says, believe in the power of the gospel. When it's preached, it shall produce. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 6, Paul says, listen, I plant. Apollos can water, but God gives the increase. But that gospel... A relationship with God had better be planted in your child's heart. In 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 5, you can also look at chapter 2 Timothy 3, 6 if you want to. We read about a young man named Timothy. Timothy had a father, according to Acts 16, that was a Gentile or an unbeliever. But his mama and his grandma, Lois and Eunice, worked so hard in him and trained him with the scriptures, trained him with the word of God, that even though his life was difficult, even though he was in a split home, when Paul found him, he was useful to God. The power of the gospel needs to be planted. Teach your children about God. Teach your children about that spiritual commitment Teach your children to love the Lord more than anything in this world. To put God first always. Now the last thing we're going to look at is the power of prayer. James chapter 5, 13 and 16 tells us that the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. One of the most important things you can do for your child Pray for them. Pray for them when they're born. Pray for them as they begin to walk, as they begin to talk. Pray for them when they go to school. Pray all the time when they become a teenager. Pray for them when they're at college, when they get married. Pray for them when they move far away. Pray for them absolutely every single day. Keep them in prayer. Job is a difficult book 
to go through because I hate seeing the suffering which he endured. But when you read in that first chapter, you see that even though his children were grown, even though they were having parties without him, every single day, Job was sacrificing and praying for his kids. He loved them, and he wanted to, as much as it was possible for him to do, to encourage them to love the Lord. One of the beautiful passages of Scripture that I love is found over in 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 28. This young lady has finally had a baby. Hannah has a baby named Samuel. And when she has the boy, she brings him to the temple. And she says about that boy, I have given him to God. He belongs to God. Let me tell you something about your child. That child belongs to God. Now, when my kids were young and I was rocking them in a rocking chair all night because they would not sleep, I thought to myself, this is going to last forever. But those days pass by. Man, they go by quick. When I used to have to strap them into a car seat, man, that took so long. But that day passed. When they started going to school, it was difficult. Getting them up in the morning, picking them up in the afternoon, homework. I mean, algebra today is not algebra that it was when I grew up. And the things that they're teaching in elementary school, I think I learned in high school or barely learned in high school. Homework is hard. But you're probably not those parents who do homework, are you? I think all parents have to do homework. When they go to college, it passes so quick. It feels like the world goes so slow. But you know what? When your child is born to the time in which your child graduates high school or turns 18, it's 936 Sundays. Every Sunday that you have is one less than that. Take the advantage of each Sunday to make, your, make sure your child learns about God and knows God. Counting for leap year from the day that your child is born to your, the day your child grows, becomes 18, 6,575 days. Now that sounds like a large number, 6,575. But each day passes. And each day that passes is one last day that you'll have. Pray for your kid. Love on your kid. Make sure your child knows what they need in order to get to heaven. Put your child in the place of God. Because God has lent you a treasure God has lent you an opportunity. God has given you a responsibility to train up your child in the way he should go. Let's go to our last slide. Raising faithful children. It's not a cut and dried thing. You can do one thing with a child that will lead him to God. With another child, perhaps you have to go a totally different direction. Some are more stubborn. Some learn very quickly. Some people have to be told often over and over. Some people can just be told. Some people have to be shown. But know your child. Study your child. Pray for your children so that they can know the Lord. Let's close our lesson with a prayer. Father in heaven, thank you for this day. Thank you for this opportunity we have to gather together to worship you. Father, I thank you for your grace and your mercies that even though we oftentimes sin, we have the cleansing of the blood of Christ. Father, I especially thank you for the children who we have here. For the 90 kids from birth all the way to the age of 18 that you have given to us. Father, I pray that you be with each one of our parents give them wisdom, to give them knowledge, 
to bring their children up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. Father, give us patience, give us strength, so that we can always remind them about your love, your grace, your hope, and your mercy. Help us in the things that we do. Help us in the way that we live, that we can be what you want us to be. Father, it's in the name of your Son that we pray, and amen. It's important for us to always remember how vital children are to the church. Now, as we close our lesson, you know what God calls new Christians? Babes or children in Christ. God loves physical children, but even more so, God loves spiritual children. Your father loves you so much that he gave his only begotten son to die on the cross. He loved Jesus. He's one with Jesus. And yet he stepped back and watched Jesus suffer, watched Jesus be blasphemed, and watched Jesus die so that you and I can be saved. And as you study the Word of God, Romans 10, 17, as you grow in your faith and trust, Hebrews 11 and verse 6, as you're willing to change your life, Luke 13, 3, you can confess the name of Jesus Christ and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. At that point, you can be translated into the Lord's church and be a child of God. What great manner of love the Father has given unto us that we should be called the children of God. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 1. In Luke chapter 15, we read about the love of a parent for his child. You see, a prodigal son who took much of his father's possessions... A prodigal son who sullied the family name by his actions. A prodigal son who put his life in a situation where there was nothing left for him ever to give back. But that father still loved his child. And every day on the porch, every day at the front of that house, the father looked at the horizon waiting for his son to come home. He prayed. He hoped. And he looked back at life and hoped that there was a future. Your father loves you. And your father desires to raise you as a faithful child.